Okay, so in this video, we're going to get a little more um, specific about where the elements are located and what that means as far as their properties go. Um, so what I want you guys to do on this, like in your note packet and also on your um, your periodic table, your, your blank one that's one sheet that you guys use, um, I want you to take your pen and I want you to make this staircase with me. So it starts off right here and we just make a set of stairs like this. Okay. Now, once again, if you look at the Regents reference tables, this staircase is drawn in for you. Um, for your honors periodic table, the staircase is not there. And the staircase tells us something um, really important. What it does is that it splits the periodic table into two halves. So on this side of the staircase, we have metals. And on this side of the staircase, we have non-metals. Okay. And depending on if something is a metal or a non-metal, it has very specific properties or characteristics. So again, guys, just knowing where something is on the periodic table, the fact that it's to the left of this staircase, you know it's a metal, you know it has to be shiny and a good conductor, even if you've never seen it or heard of it before, okay? Um, the elements that are touching the staircase, I want you guys to circle them with me. Um, you could do this in your notes and on your periodic table. So it's all of the elements that are sitting on top of the steps, including astatine down here. And it's these two elements underneath the steps. These are called metalloids. So they're neither metals or non-metals. They're somewhere in the middle, and we'll talk about them in a couple minutes. Um, but you do have to know that they're there, okay? Now, guys, if you think about what we know about metals, all right, we want to think about properties. So if something is on the metal side, we know it's going to have luster. It's going to be shiny. Um, we're going to know that it's malleable and ductile meaning that I can hammer it into sheets, I can stretch it into thin wire, I can, I can do things to it, I can bend it without breaking it, okay? That's what it means to be malleable or ductile. Um, we, talked about, we talked about phases. Um, most, I guess it's okay to write it here again, most metals are solid at STP. Um, mercury is the only exception. So if we're telling you something's a metal, you're going to assume that it's a solid. Um, they're good conductors. And we have down here that Cu is the most conductive. And we're talking about heat and electricity here, guys. If it's a metal, it's a good conductor. Okay. Um, something to know about metals. And again, this is, this is going to come up. Um, this is going to come up later on, but it's okay, I guess, to talk about it now. Um, metals form positive ions. So in the atom unit, we looked at, um, sorry, I'm saying atom, so I'm writing atom. Um, we looked at ions, meaning you either lose or gain electrons and you get a charge. If it's a metal, it's always going to lose electrons and it's going to become positively charged when it becomes an ion. So that's something that's important to know. Um, let's see. Another thing we're going to write in here, guys, and you're not really going to know what it means until a couple of videos from now, but it's good to have it in this spot. If it's a metal, it's going to have a low electronegativity. And a low ionization energy. So um, in a nutshell, because we're going to spend a whole video on those two words, um, in a nutshell, it, that those are the things that make it easy for metals to lose electrons. Those are the reasons why metals lose electrons instead of gain electrons to become, um, to become stable, okay? I'm trying to think if I missed anything. Um, I, guess, I guess it's safe to add in here, guys, um, why metals are solid at STP except for mercury, we can assume that most of them have high melting points and that's why. 
Okay, so now if we jump down to our nonmetals, they're the opposite of metals. So instead of saying they have luster, we can say that they're dull. Um, if we try to bend them, they're going to break. So they're brittle if they're in the solid phase. Um, we do have solid liquid and gas, so that's important. Um, we can say that nonmetals in general have low melting points compared to metals, and that's why we find them in so many other phases other than solid. Um, they are poor conductors of heat and electricity. They, um, they form negative ions. So when a nonmetal wants to get stable, it's going to gain electrons to do that. And all nonmetals are going to do that. Um, as far as electronegativity and ionization energy, we can say that they're high. And again, um, you don't really know what these words mean yet, but for today, you just need to understand that these are the reasons why metals, uh, nonmetals gain electrons instead of losing them to become stable. Okay, so I think that that's it on our metals versus nonmetals. As far as the metalloids go, um, all you need to know, guys, is that they have properties of both. That's why they don't really fit in on either side. Um, for example, if you saw silicon in real life, um, it's shiny. It has luster like a metal does, but it's also brittle. If you tried it to manipulate its shape, it would crumble up into pieces. So it kind of has different properties from both sides. Um, and also, guys, they're known as semiconductors. So they're not good or bad conductors of electricity. They're right there in the middle. Okay, so know your metalloids and know that they can fit in on either side. Um, here's like a nice little picture of um, some of the elements in real life at STP. Um, so I always feel like it's kind of interesting, interesting to, to see that. Um, and we have, we have a book in school um, that has this chart in it and then some information about all the elements if you're interested in looking at any of them a little bit further. Um, now, aside from just saying, okay, on the left side we have metals and on the right side we have nonmetals and here are your general properties, we took some of the specific groups or columns on each side and gave them even more specific names, gave them their own names because there are things that are really special about those specific groups even. So if you're in group one, you're called an alkali metal. And I want to make note here, guys, hydrogen, hydrogen is a gas, hydrogen is a non-metal. We should actually go back and label that. Um, I think that's a good idea. So, yeah, hydrogen is on the metal side of the periodic table because it has one valence electron. It's in that group, um, but it's a gas at STP, and as far as its properties go, it's its properties are more similar to the non-metal side than the metal side. So just be careful that you don't group hydrogen in with the alkali metals. Okay, so what's really special about the alkali metals is that they're the most reactive metals on the table. They're super reactive. They are never found uncombined. which means they're, they're never alone. They're always in a compound. When, um, when atoms are unstable, they bond with something to form a compound to get more stable. And if something is very, very unstable, it will always quickly bond to something else. It won't sit around by itself. So you'll never be like walking through nature and be like, oh, there's a hunk of sodium on the ground over there. Um, if you wanted to find sodium or lithium or anything in group one, you would have to find a compound that has that element in it and then do a reaction to separate that compound. They're never found uncombined. Um, group two, these are called the alkaline earth metals. And they're the second most reactive metals. They're not as reactive as group one, but they're pretty darn reactive. 
Um, they're mostly found in ores, which are rock mixtures. So they can be like mined. Um, and that's why they're called alkaline earth metals because of where they're found. So that's what's important about group two. Um, now groups three through 11, that's that big chunk of elements right in the middle of the periodic table, that chunk that's like kind of in the middle, but like lower than the other two sides. Um, these are called the transition metals. And um, what's important for you guys to know about the transition metals is that um, they can form multiple positive ions. So um, group one, for example, the only ion they can form is plus one. Group two can only become a plus two ion. If you're a transition metal, that means that you can lose electrons from your valence shell, but you could also lose electrons from inner shells or the D block. So, so for example, copper. Copper can be a plus one ion or it could be a plus two ion depending what it's bonding to. So it can lose electrons from more than just the outer shell, which is something unique about this section. Um, something else unique is that the transition metals make colorful solutions. So what does that mean? Um, if I take sodium, which is a group one metal, and I combine it with chlorine and I make sodium chloride, that's table salt. Think about what that looks like when I dissolve it in water. It's clear, right? It's colorless and clear. If I take copper and I combine it with chlorine, I make copper chloride, and then I dissolve that powder in water, it's gonna be blue. So Cu is blue. Um, let me just give you some examples. Um, cobalt, and like I said, guys, depending on the op oxidation state on the charge, it'll make different colors. The cobalt plus two ion is also blue, but the cobalt plus six ion would make a pink solution when you dissolve it in water. Um, manganese would make purple. So anytime they ask you about making a certain color, you want to look for an answer choice. You want to look for a metal that's in this middle section on the periodic table because they will be colorful when you dissolve their compounds in water. All right. All right. Now we're going to jump over to group 17. Um, group 17 is called the halogens. And what's important about them is they're the most reactive nonmetals on the table. So they're similar to group one as far as their reactivity goes, but they react in a different way because they're non-metals instead of metals. So they're very, very reactive. Um, important things to know is that they are all diatomic. All right. Um, so we have, if we go from the top, we have um, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. We'll stop there. So, so there's never just going to be like a single atom of chlorine floating around in the air. Um, it'll always come in a pair as diatomics. There are other diatomics on the table. We'll talk about those in a minute, but know that group 17 has all diatomics in it. It's also the only group on the periodic table that has elements in all three phases at STP. So fluorine and chlorine are gases. Bromine is a liquid and iodine is a solid. Only column on the periodic table that has that. Okay, um, group 18, these are called my noble gases. So obviously that's why we know that they're all gases at STP. Um, what's important about them is that they are stable, therefore they are non-reactive. And why is that? They have a full valence shell. Remember before we talked about having eight electrons? The noble gases all have eight electrons. 
and their valence shells. So they don't need to bond with anything to get stable. They're happy all by themselves. Um, another word you're going to see, guys, that you can think of noble gases when you see it. If you see the word monatomic, that means single atom. It means the atom is happy by itself. This is the only group on the periodic table that the atoms are completely happy by themselves because they're stable. All right. Um, some other notes, and then we're going to stop after this. Um, so guys, like I said, the diatomics, these are um, Brinkelhoff. So diatomics means they always come as two. So most of them are in group 17, but anything else that's on this list, these are your other diatomics. We do have some other elements that can form these really, really large molecules, bigger than, bigger than just two atoms together. Um, so carbon can actually form this like soccer ball structure where 60 atoms of carbon attach to each other to make this one giant molecule. Um, sulfur can do it with eight. Phosphorus can do it with four. So those are just some examples of things you might see. I want you to know where they came from. Um, and finally, guys, when you see the word radioactive, that means it's got an unstable nucleus. Okay, when the proton to neutron ratio is really far away from one to one, um, the nucleus can be very unstable and can actually start to decay. It can start to emit or get rid of particles to try to make itself more stable. Um, so that's a nuclear reaction, and we're going to talk about that in another unit. Um, for now, you just have to know what it means to be radioactive. It means that the nucleus is unstable, um, and you have to know which elements are radioactive. Anything PO or above. So lead, lead is element number 82. There are some stable isotopes of lead and some unstable isotopes of lead. Anything PO or above, every single isotope of that element is unstable, so it's radioactive. You can never have a stable atom of polonium or anything with an atomic number higher than that. All right, so a lot of information to take in here today, guys. Um, please go back and reread. We're going to give you some questions to answer. Um, and then we'll talk more in the next video about how atomic structure um, relates to the properties of the elements. All right, have a good day, guys.